Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you. Those of you that are here physically, those of you online, thanks so much for joining us. We're getting quite an online group, so welcome. Special welcome to the Here and Now Center, Matthew Gunnison. We have a very special guest tonight. Uh, we're just setting up a meditation cushion for a special guest right now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, after the meditation. <laughs> now let's go ahead and begin with some meditation to just settle our bodies, speech and minds, natural state, and just focus a little bit on developing our attention, stabilizing, just getting some mental stability. Just take a few moments to invite your awareness into your body. Just let your awareness settle in, settling into the stability, the solidity of your body. Just taking a little time to just ground our awareness, allowing our bodies to be relaxed and at ease, and just resting our awareness in the sensations of the body. And now as we prepare to begin, let's take a few moments to establish our refuge and cultivate bodhicitta. And for those of you without such a practice, we invite you to just set a really good motivation to take a few moments to be real clear about your intention for meditating and for being here tonight, cultivating your highest potentials. Now, having set our motivation, cultivated bodhicitta, let's just take a couple of minutes to just check in with our bodies, do a body scan, relax, and release any tension that you might have in your body. So I'll invite you to do this at your own pace. We'll take about two minutes. And the invitation is to just scan from the crown of your head down to the soles of your feet. If you notice any tension, give yourself permission to relax and release it. Relaxing any tension in your forehead or your jaw, relaxing your shoulders, etc. Just take a little time to scan down, relax and release any tension that you may come upon.
And then when you're ready, go ahead and shift your attention to the breath. Let the breath be the object of your meditation. Allow your breath to be natural, unmodified. Just allow your body to breathe, no need to interfere. But focus your attention on the sensations of the breath as it enters and exits your body. Let this be the object of your meditation. Each breath a new moment and a new opportunity to be present.
If you notice your mind wanders for some unknown reason, just relax, release the thoughts, and just return to the breath.
Be aware of this breath, this moment, each breath a new moment.
When you're ready, you can bring your awareness forward. All right. I'm going to be back. It's potluck night. So, uh, and for those of you online, good to have you as well. So we've been beginning a new teaching on the six perfections. This is the path of the Bodhisattva. And we just began last, last week. And I do want to uh, make sure I allow time for questions. Simultaneously, we, ran, we did something new. We ran a course that people sign up for. And it was uh, Buddhism 101. And the idea was that there's a lot of people who are not maybe uh, thinking so much about being a Buddhist as they're just interested about Buddhism. They've had a lot of, you know, heard a lot of things that's interesting. And people have a lot of questions about Buddhism, a lot of um, things they've always wondered about. And so the idea was that we spent five weeks just going through Buddhism 101, what's the foundation, and why do different Buddhist traditions do different things. And it was a great uh, success. We really enjoyed it. But it also makes me aware that uh, many of you may have questions that you've pondered or have popped up or they're just curiosities. So I thought, uh, you know, I do want to make time at the end that uh, if there is some curiosity, some questions, maybe not directly related to the teaching, uh, that we spent a little time because I know I had a lot. I, I remember going to the Dharma Center in Long Beach uh, and asking them crazy things. But, you know, there were things I was taught or thought about. And so he had always had, you know, time for questions. And my hand go up. I mean, there's this guy who still goes there named Vladimir. He goes, you're that guy who asked that question, you know. And that was, you know, 19 years ago. Uh, but it was a misperception. So it was really helpful. So I think, uh, you know, I'd like to make that opportunity available. I know we have a lot of people online. So, you know, you're able to ask questions as well through that. Just raise your hand. There's a little button. Right. So... As we engage in this uh, path of a bodhisattva, these six perfections, six paramitas, we talked a lot last week around uh, you know, what makes these uh, activities that we're engaging in the path of a bodhisattva. And it has a lot to do with our motivation, our understanding of our experience, and the differentiation between just me wanting to get better is in a Theravada schools where you really focus on, um, you know, I have these mental afflictions. I'm going to uh, seek liberation. I don't want to suffer. And obviously, I don't want others to suffer. And these early teachings are really focused on that. And later, uh, after these practices had proven quite productive, constructive, and people are finding liberation, our hearts are finding their way. Uh, According to, and I'm depending upon a, a wonderful Theravada scholar, Bhikkhu Bodhi, his reflections, because there's a lot of views about how these, how did Mahayana Buddhism have it, how did Tibet, how did it evolve? But I, I like uh, the way he explains it, makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, it doesn't mean it's the right way, for the record, just because something makes sense to me. Uh, but he noted something. He's a scholar. He's someone who has really studied Buddhist texts and knows them inside and out, has really looked with, with subtlety and detail. And he noticed that in the early Pali canon, you know, the question uh, was always, you know, asking for these teachings, you know, to be liberated. How do I become liberated? Uh, essentially, how do I find nirvana would be the way they put it. And, uh, and so the Buddha gave those teachings, taught the path to nirvana which is an arhat path. What they didn't ask was, how do you become a Buddha? Those aren't the requests. They never requested those teachings. And uh, even in those uh, teachings, there's a distinction between a Buddha and an arhat, you know, the teacher and the, those that follow the path. And so he taught the way to liberation. He taught an arhat. And later, some of these uh, 
practitioners who are finding this very productive, they start thinking, well, how do you become a Buddha? <laughs> you know, and that's a different question. And the distinction being is a Buddha is someone who finds the path, who uh, through investigation is able to develop a path and also then share it with others. And in uh, Tibetan tradition, you know, we just see it as a fully awakened one who's uh, free of all obscurations. And so they emphasize this, this bodhisattva path. And, and that path to being a Buddha is the bodhisattva path. Uh, not to say being a har Narhats, you know, that's not too shabby, right? <laughs> You're liberated, it's, it's all good. Uh, but there is, uh, you know, just different teachings. And one of the primary distinctions in those paths of becoming a bodhisattva is this uh, aspiration that uh, I don't want anyone to suffer. It's this commitment that I'm not here uh, just to, to find nirvana, to overcome afflictions, but I don't want anybody to suffer. I understand my interdependence with everyone. I understand uh, this connection that we all have and that my experience of everything is interrelated. And uh, uh, my care and concern for others is as great as my own. And with that understanding of this great compassion that arises, it becomes a fuel from which I can engage fully in a bodhisattva path. And it's with that motivation then that we engage in these teachings uh, with the idea that I am not doing this for me, I'm doing this for everyone. And everything I'm doing is connected to that purpose. So that path of a bodhisattva then got developed uh, and ripened in the Mahayana traditions, which came later. And then uh, also a little bit uh, transition, you got Zen, you got Chan, uh, it's Pure Land Buddhism, and then you have the Tibetans. And so they're all in the bodhisattva range, and they all uh, really emphasize these six perfections. And it's within these, these six perfections uh, that is brought up a couple of ways of looking at it. One of them, because we're big with numbers, especially if you're trained in the Tibetan tradition. Six perfections, the, the, the first five are the skillful means, the method, and the sixth is the wisdom, so compassion and wisdom. Um, and um, these, um, these attributes that we do is, is always combining those two, but they're not uh, isolated. They're, they're very much together. That as I engage in generosity, I have, and we'll talk about tonight, how does generosity lead to an easier way of being ethical? You know, how does being ethical really lend itself for my concentration and my efforts? And how does uh, having some wisdom <laughs> override all of this so that I understand the benefits of generosity and ethics. And so it's not a linear thing. It's not, you know, I get uh, generosity nailed and then I'm going to learn to be ethical. And then I'm going to, you know, learn to be patient. Uh, you're going to need to be pretty patient <laughs> to be ethical and, uh, you know, probably to be generous too. So, uh, so even though we're, we're going to talk about them in this way, we're going to find that actually it's with ethics, which is where we're at today, uh, you're going to see that it encompasses them all, really. Um, so last week we talked about generosity. We talked about this mind of generosity. And, uh, and then generosity is born of a, a clear understanding that where does my suffering come from? You know, me and mine. Me and mine. You and yours. You know, there's no way that we're going to find inner peace and well-being with tending to me and mine. Because you and yours are in my way a lot. <laughs> I was talking today to some people who are really struggling with traffic in Austin, Texas. There's a lot of people in their way. And they, and they don't always use their blinker, apparently. And so, if we start to, you know, grasp this, this understanding that pretty much everything I have in my life is because of others, and everything I know about myself is because of others, the fact that I could be sitting here is because of others, 
any uh, opportunity to grow and learn or be purposeful in life is because of others. Uh, it's really with that rich understanding that we can embrace this, this uh, path, understanding that uh, you are the cause for my enlightenment. <laughs> I couldn't know compassion without you. I couldn't know, I couldn't know my mental afflictions without you. You are very good at showing them to me. I appreciate that sometimes. And uh, I couldn't know what I need to work on without you. And, um, and I couldn't eat and I couldn't put on clothing and I wouldn't have clothing. And You know, we rarely understand that because I'm very separate. And we even say, I'm taking care of me and mine. But it's really we and ours. Right? It's really we and ours. And so with that, uh, you know, coming upon this path with this foundational understanding that we are interconnected, that we are dependent upon each other, that uh, any good that I experience is because of others. And with that understanding, I engage in this recognition that I suffer a lot. I suffer a lot. And um, so do you. You know? And, uh, and maybe it's not necessary. And so there's some teachings in this path. As we engage now, I'm going to engage in this path with that understanding. And that then is this bodhisattva motivation. And there's a complete different teaching on how we cultivate that, but with that, we enter into these perfections. And with that motivation, then uh, it's much easier to be generous when I recognize that we're in this together, right? You know, I often uh, will say that, you know, I, I, uh, is there any reason I should love you any less than I love my grandchildren? You know, I once said that was my daughter in the room. She was a Dharma teacher, and I didn't have her. I said, is there any reason I should love you any less than my daughter? I told her, I could think, yeah, we probably should. Uh, but if we think about that, is there? Why should I care for you any less than my daughters or my grandchildren? Everybody here is somebody's grandchild, somebody's daughter, brother, sister, everybody, right? And yet I'll get the stupid shirt that says, you know, best grandpa ever, right? Like you're not a good grandparent or your grandchildren aren't cute and adorable. And, when, and uh, this, this idea of that, why couldn't I just appreciate yours? So, you know, the distinction there becomes, well, I can learn to, to understand that and care for you more and start knocking down those barriers. Uh, doesn't mean you get an allowance. It means that uh, with my children, I have certain responsibilities. They're my, you know, I take care of them, I'm their, their parent, and I have these duties and responsibilities. Um, but I also recognize you have those with your family. And I recognize that our kids might go to school together, and I recognize that you know, our food needs to be safe you know, for us to eat, and I recognize that. Um, if we're well taken care of, you know, we're not acting out in unhealthy ways. And if people have enough to eat, they're not robbing, they're not harming each other. If people feel loved and cared for, they're not acting out in harmful ways. And so if I start to recognize that, I can start thinking, wow, you know, what can I do in this, in this path that can help and so there's some tangible things I can do right here and now that also lead to this uh, potential being a Buddha where I can help a lot more. You know, I can help a lot more as a Buddha than as just conventional John here. So I'm making this commitment, but along that way, I have the opportunity to make a difference here and now. And these perfections really uh, provide that opportunity. And the generosity that we had talked about was this... Uh, you know different types of generosity, but but how do we how do we give and how do we offer? You know people with treasure. You know not just material or safety and protection. We have lists. I right? offer uh, for safety and protection or material needs or uh, the Dharma. 
But the core of it is really twofold. One is generosity to benefit others. But who do I really benefit there? Because what's the core root affliction that creates all my suffering? Attachment. Desire grasping. A, an afflicted attachment, right? So by generosity, I'm counteracting like one of my core root sources of my own mental affliction and suffering. I have that opportunity. So as I'm engaging in a practice that seemingly that benefit others, I'm actually addressing the very core issue in my life is my own self-cherishing attitude from which arises resentment, jealousy, frustration, you know, all that stuff, thinking that I'm stuck in traffic instead of I am traffic. Right? So generosity really plays this beautiful opportunity. And so what, what's one of the things that we can offer generosity that we cherish the most? Yeah, our attention, right? Our attention. Our time. You know, sometimes generosity can be as easy as writing a check. But sitting there listening to somebody for half an hour. <laughs> Come on, I'll give you a check, man. It's worth 50 bucks. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, we talked about it. I want to get too much, but I know we have people who were here last week, so I'm just doing a little, little recap. And it sets it up for, uh, for really getting into ethics. So if we can start offering people our time, our attention, you know, our attention, even if it's a minute, two minutes, uh, you know, what if people became alive to us, you know, that we come in contact with at the store or on the roads, so those people in the cars with us, they're not just traffic we're stuck in. They're other human beings with worries, concerns, fears, and places to go. And you know, what if I thought about that when I drove with them? That we're we're all trying to go somewhere, and we'd all like to get there safe. These are also uh, some opportunities being generous with how we attend to others. Really beneficial. So. One of the uh, foundations, when they, even though it's not linear, they, they do teach generosity first because it tends to be an easier thing to do, to start learning to do, and it, and it attacks the, the core root because attachment's kind of that issue. And that allows then for us to uh, really get into our perfection of ethics in a way that is much easier and if we think of it this way, ethics, uh, as, as I was listening, we'll talk by general to the children. And uh, she's funny sometimes. And she was going, yeah, a lot of people in the West, they, they have a lot of trouble toward morality. They don't like that word very much. Ethics, they don't like that word too much either sometimes. You know, actually, they don't like being told what not to do. Yeah, maybe that's it. And uh, being told how to think. You know, so we have these barriers here. And so I'm, often we may find that there's words that uh, we get a little, a little bump up against, you know. And, uh, and if we really get the idea of what ethics is being taught here, you, we won't have that. You know, if, uh, if I start to understand the idea that ethics here is the opportunity for me to improve the quality of my life. Wow, that's a whole different thing. Because yeah, I'd like to be happy. I'd like to have some contentment. I'd like to have some inner peace. I'd like to, you know, have a sense of being okay when I'm with others and not have something to hide and look people in the eye and to know I'm worthy and valuable and and I'm okay, and I feel pretty good, and I can be in a room with anyone at any time, and I'm not comparing myself, contrasting, evaluating, and I have this value 
And so do you. And what would that be like? You know, what would that be like? And so just approaching, uh, though it's under a label of ethics, and understanding that I'm creating causes <laughs> to have self-worth and well-being, inner peace, some joy in my life, uh, experiences that uh, are much more pleasant. That's the approach with ethics and, and, uh, and within this, this perfection of ethics, there's these three categories. That root intention here, root understanding is that these are not things that I need to avoid because I'll get punished or to do because I'll get rewarded. That, because, um, you know, that's the kind of thing, you know, you know in the West, we, we, many of us, I know, I, I grew up a Judeo-Christian, and, and so my, my thoughts around it, you know, have these sort of barriers, you know, uh, though I don't have any, uh, I don't have, I don't carry baggage. I, I'm actually, I love going to church. I had good experience. I applied to be a priest when I was 18, actually. Uh, they didn't think I was spiritually fit enough. They were, they were correct. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I didn't have that baggage per se, but I did have a view that came from that kind of teaching. So it was, you know, it had understanding this from this other perspective, which is that, well, first off, if I'm generous and I'm less attached to things in me and mine, is it going to be easier to be ethical with others? Yeah. <laughs> Right? Uh, more I'm focused on me and mine, it's going to be, yeah, you know, I'm not going to tell you I have that extra bottle of Perrier, that, you know, because I'm going to be thirsty later. Uh, <laughs> oh, you might be thirsty. I offer it. You know, that uh, I will I'll lie less, right? Because uh, the less attachment, the less need to uh, get engaged in non virtuous activities, as so tend to be very self centered activities. So generosity really sets that up. And then ethics comes into the opportunity of improving the quality of my whole experience in life that I get to participate in. And uh, when we understand the laws of karma, and karma doesn't need to be a big esoteric mystical thing. I mean, there's layers that gets complicated, but um, you know, so much of karma is just what we think, do, and say. We tend to think, do, and say more. That's, we build habits, right? <laughs> and creating causes to think and say and do this. I do it a lot. I hang around a bunch of knuckleheads a lot. I, I speak knucklehead rather fluently now. So there was a cause for that, right? Um, if I'm hanging around a lot of virtuous people doing, you know, kind things, I'm setting a cause to, you know, think like that more. And, um, and so... You know, karma's pretty pretty simple in that sense. Uh, they asked this this monk, he was, he was pretty good, uh, you know, just give him this sketch, just a scholar, just off the chart, brilliant, and talk about karma. They asked him some question like the challenge, and he says, well, it's pretty simple. Um, I went to college, and that created the karma for me to have a degree. <laughs> yeah, right? I created a cause, and I got a degree. I wouldn't have got a degree if I didn't go to college, right? And... Uh, you know, it's not rocket science sometimes. It doesn't have to be a big mystical thing. Likewise, if I do things that are unethical that I don't feel good about, do you think I'll feel good about who I am? No. Again, not rocket science. <laughs> right. No big judgmental God up there saying, you did this, you're going to suffer like that. Just a pretty simple thing. When I do things I feel good about, I'm going to feel good about me. That happens this lifetime. That doesn't need to play out over real complicated systems. And so when we look at ethics, that's, that's where we're going at. But when we bring in this understanding of bodhisattva, I have a mic on, well, you can hear my breath. Right? That was exciting. <laughs> because now, when I have, uh, let's say, an ethical uh, vow of harmlessness, you know, that I am 
taking it upon myself to really engage in an ethic of harmlessness. The whole world gets impacted because everyone around me I'll ever come in contact with is going to be safe. What would it be like if all of us took just one vow of harmlessness? What would that do in the world for one day? Sometimes we seem, seem so powerless and we don't recognize um, that if I bring a little more loving kindness in my life today, there's more loving kindness in the world right now. It's not some big faraway thing. If I'm more loving and kind, there's more loving kindness in the world. If I bring that into my interactions with others, they're impacted. Others do that, it's impacted. Uh, people will uh, want world peace, but we're not working on inner peace, right? I don't, you know, I'm yelling at some guy about what an idiot he is because of his political views or whatnot. <laughs> yeah. Probably not a good way to cultivate world peace. Uh, being an example of that peace and attending to them skillfully might be a better way, right? Uh, I've been on a thing with Nelson Mandela of late, brought it up a couple times because we used him as a quote in one of our daily teachings. But the profound wisdom that he brought into prison, you know, for all those years, um, was that when he was in prison, and, he, you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, we're talking decades here, he uh, made it a point to become friends with the guards, to be curious about them, to ask about their family, to know what sports teams they like, to have a dialogue. And yeah, I'm in prison, you're a guard, this is unfeel, you know, all that stuff, um, racism, the difficulties. Um, but, you know, all those years later, he's becoming president, <laughs> which is pretty far cry from I'm in prison. This is, to being the president and, uh, and in his front row were his guards at the inauguration who are his friends. And, um, and so sometimes things that seem like impossible and far away are not so much so. As a matter of fact, they happen in front of our eyes and, um, and we don't see them through, through our own sort of confusion. And so while some things seem so aspirational, uh, there's so many things that uh, that can be transformed because we don't know what tomorrow will be like. There's no way you'd have thought when he's in prison, these are the guards, that he's going to be the president of South Africa, right? It's, there's no, does not compute, right? And I don't know who's going to call me tomorrow, right? But I think I can tell you how things are going to turn out. But I don't even know who's going to call me tomorrow. Nor do I know what kind of qualities I'll be able to develop in myself if I you know, work on things. I only know what I know now and my perception of things as being a certain way. And so when I start to engage in these ethics, and I'm starting to understand that uh, there's these three categories. The first one is to really avoid these uh, unwholesome, un unwholesome activities, things that are detrimental, like being harmful. So harmlessness would be, uh, you know, avoiding harming others, avoiding stealing, avoiding, you know, behaviors that harm myself or others in some way. Well, the world's getting to be a better place, but I'm getting to be a better person, and I'm starting to develop myself and. Spiritually, ethics is the foundation of all growth. Without the ethics, you know, that's the fertilizer that we grow out of. Uh, and we can't grow without that. Analogy is often used is uh, so many people meditate on the nature of reality, you know, meditate on emptiness, the nature of reality. But they'll lie. <laughs> So in my behaviors, I'm lying, but when I'm meditating, I want to know the truth of reality. 
you know, it's, it's not because it works very well, right? <laughs> I want world peace, but, you know, I'm talking bad and yelling at somebody about whatever. That I don't recognize the disconnect often. But uh, these engagement of ethics, of uh, engaging in this world from a more wholesome, interactive way with, with this understanding, provides the opportunity to develop ourselves and potentials that we, we can't even imagine. Um, I often use just my own example. You know, I, uh, I remember going to teachings at the center in Long Beach with my teacher. She goes up there and, oh, you know, he'd give a talk. And, you know, he's talking about non-dual nature, reality, emptiness, things like that. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's no way I'm getting that. You know, I'm here, there's you. I, you know, like, wall, like there's, you know, I'm just going to try to be a better human being, all right? I'm here to, to try to not be such a jerk, you know? And uh, I'm tired of them, that. And, and uh, I would go, I'd prostrate, I'd sit, and it was all this Tibetan stuff, which I totally didn't get. And, uh, and, um, and, you know, and stuff's over my head, and I'd ask stupid questions a lot. And, um, but I, I, there was not even an idea that I was going to comprehend, you know, these teachings on sort of emptiness or interdependence. You know, I'm just going to work on being a better person. As I knew and I could see, and I'd had enough personal experience in my lifetime, the value of that and the practicality of understanding um, the world that we live in more accurately. So I'd, I'd go and I'd do that. And, and, uh, and I, you know, I'd work on being a better person. And I remember going to my first teaching, my Dalai Lama, and it was on Nargajuna, uh, who was the quintessential, like, teacher on emptiness. Like, it was just, like, I'm just trying to stay awake. You know, I'm putting peppermints in my mouth. And it's, you know, I got the text there. It's just, you know, I don't know, hopefully there's some good here, but I am not falling asleep like that person next to me. Um, <laughs> that's what happens at these teachings, high level teachings, and you're there for hours, and transmissions are happening, you know, people just get wiped. You know, I was doing everything I could. Didn't understand a word of it, though. Um, so, you know, that's just not the case anymore. I still don't have any great wisdom or anything, but uh, the teachings that I once had no idea about um, are, are much more a part of my life in a very lively way. They didn't used to be. But there's no way that I ever saw that coming. And, um, and so I just think that over the years of being more ethical, of understanding this interdependence that we have and understand that you're valuable and understand that I'm creating my own suffering by my behaviors and attitudes and the karma I'm creating with my labels I stick on everyone. I just stop doing that. Start trying to be more helpful and uh, keep, you know, doing some practices and meditating. And, and then words that I once read that had no meaning to me eventually had quite a bit of meaning to me. And um, what used to be very effortful is much less effort. So it's like that in my own experience. And you know, it's taught like that. It's taught that uh, often we can have the answer to everything in front of us, we can't see it. Uh, we can have a Buddha in front of us, we can't see the Buddha, because we haven't created the conditions for that. Uh, many people will come to a teaching and somebody will go, wow, that was the best thing ever. Somebody else go, no, nah, you know, I didn't get this. And, and it's not the outer experience, you know, it's our inner qualities that we're, uh, you know, finally creating the conditions to, to understand, to integrate. To. So ethics is this rich fertilizer from which all this can happen. And this happens quite a bit with uh, the ability to uh, recognize that these ethics are the conditions from which I will eliminate suffering currently, but in the long term for you as well, because my behaviors are going to be more 
engaged and connected. So with uh, the first category it is to, uh, it's really about stop doing things. You know, it's interesting how much better my life could be if I just not do some things. <laughs> you know? You know, if I just don't do that, my life will be a lot better. And then I go do it. But <laughs> uh, it's amazing how, how much better our life could be if I just stop doing things, right? There's a lot of habits that we have that if we just stop doing them, our life will improve. I find that fascinating because it's like, uh, it sounds like a non-action, you know, like, oh, you just don't do that, you know, and my life will improve. And, uh, and yet I, <laughs> I can find it very difficult to not do something. And I'm a pretty lazy person, so that's shocking. Um, so, but it, it's really quite a shift to think that I deserve to not do that. Because I'm going to feel a lot better if I don't. I, nothing's being taken from me. I deserve to, to stop creating more mental afflictions. Right? I deserve the feeling I feel good about when I don't do something I don't feel good about. That's a reward. And, and there's a nice little trick. Trick's a funny word. Helpful skill, tool, tool. Call it that. As a Theravad monk. It's so like, for example, um, it was in the context of, of meditation, which is helpful, but when we do something or don't do something that we don't, let's say we don't engage in activity that we were kind of feeling like, it was, I was going to do that thing or I was going to act on so, or something that, you know, that I know I wouldn't feel that good about, and I don't do it. Well, it's really nice to take a moment and recognize the value of not doing that. How good I feel about not doing that. Pretty good I feel good about not doing that. And if I make it all through the night and still didn't call that person up <laughs> and uh, feel pretty good in the morning, to, to recognize how good I feel about what's the quality of my mind that I didn't do that. And I think we miss that a lot. I think sometimes I struggle a lot and I don't do something and it's grin and bear it and, and I don't act out the way or I didn't yell at someone or I didn't, you know, act out, so whatever it is. Um, and I don't take the time to go, wow, what's that feel like to not do that about myself? <clears throat> and take a little time to saturate that feeling, wow. And when I uh, do uh, engage in an activity I feel good about that was kind of difficult, you know, didn't really want to do it, but I did it. Maybe I meditated. That was, that was the context of this, this teaching. Was that, um, you know, people often struggle with maintaining meditation practice. I'm sure none of you ever have. But there's a few people in this world that, that on occasion might struggle with a daily meditation practice. Yeah, I've heard about it. I've read such cases. There's a few case <laughs> studies. And, um, and so the advice was, and, and what, what worked for this monk was that as he ended his meditation, he would take some time to reflect on how did he feel about having meditated? What's the quality of my mind now? How do I feel that I did it? And so he would leave his cushion thinking, I'm better now than I was before. And, but he'd take a little time before he got and said, the, the gong came off, the mind comes back. <laughs> oh, thank God, that thing's over. I got stuff to do. Um, so just pause and go, what's the quality of my mind now? What was that like? I meditated. You know, what's that feel? So, so I'm saturating that, that really wonderful, well, what that's like. And, and then I'm eager to come back to that. And I don't think we do that enough. I think in a lot of things, I think we have moments where we feel pretty good about ourselves in some way that, you know, not prideful, but that, yeah, that was the right thing to do. And remember what that felt like to do the right thing. What it felt like to not engage in an unwholesome activity. 
I deserve to not do that. So with this uh, perfection of ethics, it's again always coming with this understanding that, you know, it's affecting many others than me. And so how many people are benefiting from me not acting out in a particular way? And the second category is to engage in constructive actions, virtuous actions, things that uh, are beneficial in some way. Uh, and so in one sense, I'm gonna stop doing things, creating karmic habits, tendencies, labels that uh, create division, conflict, resentment in my mind, shame, guilt. So I'm gonna just stop doing that as much as possible. I'm gonna start doing things that are more constructive, more productive. Understand that as I do that, the world's a better place, right? Understand that as I do that, I'm creating the seeds of awakening for myself and others. And so that, you know, practices such as loving kindness or compassion, activities like that, just even our own meditation practice, and, you know, the, these are constructive uh, practices. What are things that we could be doing, for example, in our uh, so-called downtime uh, that could be constructive or productive? You know, uh, one thing that, you know, so, you know we... Um, I should take a mindfulness course. Okay, I'm going to use this. Um, little little uh, wrist, you know, with, with little beads on. Bigger ones, mollas, that's what I was looking for. I was pretty sure I put it in my pocket when I came down here. I'll solve that mystery later, maybe. <laughs> So a lot of people do mantras, right? You'll see people, you know, Om Mani Padme, Om Mani Padme, Om Mani Padme, or, you know, or some other mantra. And the, the word mantra, for example, uh, literally means mind protection. That's what we're doing, we're protecting the mind. Because if I'm uh, act, you know, doing a mantra and thinking about benefiting all sentient beings, I'm not thinking about what a jerk so-and-so is or worrying about, <laughs> you know, what's going on there. I'm protecting my mind with a virtuous mental activity, right? Virtuous thoughts, I'm putting love out there, kindness, I'm thinking of others. And so I'm creating those karmic causes, those habits and tendencies in my own mind stream. Uh, and I'm not allowing my mind to go off to tangents. And so like a real nice virtuous activity I like to do is, you know, I, I have a little list of people that are suffering. Some people I know that I need some prayers and things of that nature. But if I'm walking down the street or if I'm doing something uh, and I'm not having to really fo focus on something, you know, my mind can go to a lot of places, planning, there's always a lot of stuff to do. But it, I find it a nice break to just say prayers for those people. I've got a little list that's on my phone and, just call it up, so-and-so is at this, and, and just do that. And, and so that's a great example, I think, of a virtuous activity that I'm engaging in that is helping me with my mind stream and benefiting others. And, um, and it's something that's easy to do, right? And take care. And so... When one thing, we stop doing things that are not very helpful or productive, and now we can start doing some things that, again, if we go back to karma, it's cause and effect. If I want a college degree, I gotta go to college, right? If I want, you know, a sense of well-being, you know, I need to do things I feel good about, so what's the virtuous activities that I'm gonna feel good about that are helpful? And um, there's, there's more worldly-oriented things, and there's um, also, you know, the, here in these teachings are emphasizing uh, from a Dharma point of view, a lot of virtuous things that we can be doing to purify our own minds, to, to um, engage in activities that cultivate spiritual merit, things that we do like that. Uh, but our worldly activities can be that way as well, right? So the most common example I give all the time, and 
And uh, for the uh, disclaimer, I do not have an interest in the restaurant restaurant business. Uh, but uh, but I do like to think when I give a tip, you know, rather than just what's twenty percent or whatnot, to think may this help you feed your children? You know, may this help you uh, get to college if they're a college student when I'm paying a bill at the restaurant. This helps. I like like there's a a wish for this, an aspiration, a more virtuous. Uh, nurturing of that. So even my more mundane things, you know, if I'm paying a, a bill, you know, what's that about? I can really hope that this helps provide for our local economy and people get their needs met. These are things that we can do in a, in a very worldly way that are cultivating this, this understanding of our interdependence and the path of awakening. And then the third category is um, the ethics of, of being of service, you know, of really going out and helping others in some way, shape, or form. And so obviously it's a lot easier if you see the interdependence, <laughs> right? And, um, and so that's a, a really wonderful practice to, to start to look at, that um, how I interact with others you know, there's a lot of things I can be doing each day and are there things that I can be doing that are going to help create the conditions for countless beings to stop suffering? You know, so again, from a Dharma point of view, are there things I can engage in that help people alleviate their mental afflictions? And, you know, that can take many, many forms. You know, a lot of people need basic food and shelter to, to get to a place like that. Um, you know, I may, uh, you know, uh, be service at my spiritual communities. I might, you know, help in those types of ways. Uh, I may just be a good example and go volunteer in, in different capacities. Uh, but this idea that um, my outer activities to benefit others are coming from this, this again, ethical value of no harm, of how do I reduce suffering? And, uh, and how can I display these, these qualities of you know, honesty, you know, care, concern, loving kindness, compassion into a world? And how can I implement those in a greater, uh, greater capacity? So looking for those opportunities to be a benefit to others. And so when we look at this perfection of uh, ethics, often, um, Check my time, I don't have a watch anymore, okay. Often we can, uh, you know, sometimes get caught up in, in sort of these lists, you know, I have, I've got a lot of lists, 10 non-virtuous actions, right? Through the body, for the speech, through the mind, I can break them down for you. Uh, and, but if we go right back to what's my root motivation, is that's right in the full path, just, dead start. Uh, am I coming from a place of harmlessness? Am I coming from a place of goodwill? <laughs> Is that my motivation? Is it to be a benefit? And, and am I doing that? Then, then we're going to have some wholesome activity, right? Is this beneficial? Is it not? When I speak with someone, am I really coming from a place of um, harmlessness or goodwill and harmlessness, you know, that we're understanding what's beneficial here? One of my teachers, he had um, come to the West, he had monastic vows, full ordination, and had been in India a long time. It's a lot easier to maintain monastic vows, like 256, or you know, a lot of vows, plus in here. Bodhisattva vows and Tantra, it's, it's a long list, right? Imagine trying to get that list in your head. But he knew that coming to the West is going to be pretty darn impossible to maintain those vows. Uh, you know, a woman, you know, picks you up at the airport to give you a ride while well, you're breaking a lot of vows. <laughs> you know, just, uh, you're not supposed to be lying. Just, just, it's just not very, uh, very tenable as a, a fully ordained monastic. When I was a monk and I had the novice vows, you know, you know, go somewhere, we'll hug you, and you're just going, yes, uh, uh, you know, like what, 
what's more beneficial to hug them or to freak out on them, you know, and push them away. So, uh, so he asked this advice, how do I maintain them? And, uh, and his teacher, Islama, basically said, you ask the fundamental question, what's most beneficial in this situation? Given this situation, what's most beneficial? Because we find ourselves in situations. And, uh, and so that's the way I think approaching uh, these ethics is uh, more valuable. I mean, it's good to know the list. It's good to understand uh, and, and really meditate on, you know, for example, how I harm others, right? Be real clear about that. Uh, or, and, and the more clear I, I can ask myself is what was the root cause I'm going to find self-cherishing. But if I can be more aware of my motivation, I may do something very unskillful with the motivation of being helpful. And I may learn from that. But the fact that my intention was to be beneficial, that's gonna carry the weight. So uh, we can do some pretty ridiculous things trying to be helpful. <laughs> and uh, we might accidentally help people trying to be harmful, I've done that before. But keep coming back to what's our motivation is gonna be, I think the, the, the key here is, you know, recognizing that my well-being and your well-being are, are tied together and um, and you are the cause for my enlightenment and if I recognize that as an understanding then my motivation to be that we all benefit and that I will use the opportunities to interact with you in ways to cultivate the merit and wisdom for awakening I can't do it without you right? in all actions that's that's the observation and so I think approaching ethics in that way, it, it's much easier, it's much more uh, fluid, it's, it's nicer, it's, uh, it's beneficial. And then we can take our actions and then uh, we have some time to meditate on them. And, and I think that's a, a real important key is, is not to have an intellectual discussion, but to uh, engage in a perfection, engage in a practice. Uh, and observe my practice and, and learn from, does this make sense? If I act in ways I feel good about, do I feel good about who I am? I mean, does that work or does it not work? Um, why am I having trouble looking at my coworker? You know, is it really all them? Or do I have something going on here? What's going on there? Um, when I get frustrated or angry or... Um, Is it really because of someone else or, you know, I'm amazed when I look deeply on my own experience, how much of it is I don't think I'm doing a good enough job in some way that I'm in deficit in some way, which totally doesn't seem like it initially. It's like, I know better, they're an idiot, whatever. And then, you know, as I go deep down there, there's an underlying insecurity <laughs> and then some sort of fear and then or I wouldn't be able to deal with this, so I don't want to have to deal with that, and then it shouldn't be like that anyway. And it's, it's just, as I peel my own onion, and this is my experience, uh, I am, uh, you know, I just keep coming back to, you know, there's so much of my, uh, those states arising in my mind is because there's some sense that I'm not, not enough, you know, in a, in a given moment, I'm not equipped for this situation. And, uh, and that's profound for me uh, because, you know, I could, uh, uh, you know, originally, you know, before you get a little deeper, you know, it, it could be fears and it could be a lot of things. But when I really get deep down, you know, for myself, I often find it's, it's really, I'm ill-equipped in this moment to deal with this. I'm not enough in some way. Uh, and I threaten or I have to deal with it, I don't want to, and I'm not ready to, and yes, it's all about me. And so, so that's an, 
the idea then is that as we engage in these, that we really take some time to deeply reflect upon them because you know, if there's truth in them, if we recognize them, if we see them in real time, then they just become a part of we're creating the, the karmic imprints of cause and effect now in ways that are really meaningful. It works a lot easier uh, if we, it's like playing a trumpet, you know, that they tell you, right? I learned to play a trumpet, you gotta practice. You know, cultivating this, this mind of awakening and, and practicing ethics is something that um, we talk about, we think about, we practice, but we observe, but we meditate on, we take some time and, and kind of go into that. I got angry today. What was that about? I mean, let me reflect on that. What was it? You know, what was my role in that? And was there some attachment there? <laughs> was I angry at the cause for my awakening? Was that what was going on? <laughs> wow, that's kind of weird. Why would I do that? And um, and then we can sit with that much again, much much like. I can sit with how I felt good about not doing something. I think we get these little epiphanies and then they just become epiphanies and then it's Tuesday. Right? And so that I think is the real value of engaging in a community and in practice where we're around people and we talk about this and we think about this and we meditate together because we become the, the opportunity, the conditions for all of us to allow these qualities to arise more frequently and to learn from our confusions. Very difficult to do alone. I have a friend who, uh, I like her, and she says, uh, you know, it's rare I have an epiphany, but I'll tell you what, I have a lot of duh epiphanies. <laughs> because so much of what we talk about is just, oh yeah, <laughs> but I, I don't think about it, right? I don't, it comes and it goes, duh epiphany. Like, oh yeah, right? Feel good about myself, do something I feel good about. You know, it's, you know again, not rocket science. Um, so we have this karma that we've created and it um, really drives us. You know, it's this uh, inertia. Right? I want to be different now. I just had this great teaching. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I got this. I'm leaving this retreat. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then, you know, it was Tuesday and I forgot all about that stuff. And, uh, you know, how many times I've had to do that. Because there's this inertia of habits and conditioning and the way I've done things that, um, you know, um, even though I have the best of intentions, my habits take over. And that's thinking habits and labeling habits. And so, if I start to understand as I approach this, that it's something that I'm going to do over time and that it evolves and that this unravels slowly that, yeah, I have this epiphany today and, and I'm gonna water it, I'm gonna nurture it and I'm going to have some lapses and, um, and that's okay because just my awareness of my unskillful activity is now a skillful activity. I wasn't even aware of it before. Now I am. We have the self-critic that is uh, not our friend. <laughs> and, um, and so to approach this with this understanding that, yeah, I, um, I've got all these uh, karmic conditions that, you know, continually I fall back into. And, and it's interesting because what I'm not looking at is that of all the seven plus billion humans on this planet, for me to be seated here thinking about being a better human being for the benefit of all sentient beings, you're just not that big a jerk. I'm going to tell you that right now. We're, we're, um, you know, we're we're uh, we're doing pretty good. 
and then we micromanage often our best of intentions and and we uh, compare ourselves with the Dalai Lama instead of who I used to be and and um, and so this this uh, embracing of this journey is recognizing this this opportunity to be uh, understanding that I'm going to uh, need the support of others and a journey that I'm on and that I'm already doing pretty good, you know, and as I've created these karma and these imprints to, that are sometimes seeming overwhelming, there are also the karma in the imprints that gave me a rare and precious human rebirth <laughs> to even be seated here. So that far outweighs. I mean, if we were to actually take a, um, a look into the qualities that, that are within us, um, you know, there's, there's an incredible amount of virtue. That's our, our basic nature, I think, if you're seated here. And there's some habits that get in the way. So ethics then becomes this really rich opportunity to finding more inner peace and quality and working on uh, the ethical behavior of being kind and supportive to myself. Because that's the benefit of all this. I'm going to feel a lot better about the journey, purpose, meaning in life. Um, wisely selfish, the Dalai Lama says. There's another way of phrasing that. Enlightened self-interest. Something like that. But, but we don't do it for us. We just get the perk. Yet we sort of do it for us, right? For having the best purpose in this life. So this perfection of ethics then is not just about a list of do's and don'ts. It's about developing a mind stream that is more naturally inclined to make the best use of the time that we have and uh, and really letting go of the, the root cause of my own suffering, my own attachments, and, um, and understanding that the cause for contentment, pleasure, well-being, you know, is virtuous activity. So that helps me, it helps you, and it creates the condition to eliminate all of these mental afflictions that, um, that are preventing me from recognizing my own Buddha nature. All right, so I'm going to pause there. Okay, we have five minutes. I thought I had 15, but yes, uh, Courtney. You mentioned training for others mm -hmm. and my perspective of others. They have questions. So, what does it sound like or look like or mean to pray for others as a Buddhist? That's an excellent question. You know, prayer in, um, in different lineages and traditions have different right. aspects. But I think that the, the fundamental overarching within Buddhism for you know, any lineage that does participate in, in prayer is that um, I'm creating a virtuous mental state. I'm... I'm um, when I'm thinking of others, someone who is, uh, you know, in need of, of something, they're in the hospital, they're have, going through a difficult time, that uh, I am creating love and kindness. I'm setting uh, from my own mind stream, but it's in, it, and I'm just going to go to a John thing now, forget about all that. Um, when I'm thinking about this person who is struggling, how can they not be linked now to my virtuous thought for them? So when I am taking my time to think about this person who's struggling in some way, and I'm saying prayers and wishing them well and wanting to see them heal and wanting to see them get their needs met, and I'm engaged in that virtuous activity, which combined with the bodhisattva motivations carrying a great deal of merit. Would I be doing that without this person suffering? No, I, I would, you know. In other words, they become a condition that gave a cause of this virtuous activity. So we're linked now, right? 
if I didn't know you were suffering, I wouldn't be praying for you, right? And so I would notice this phenomenon quite often uh, when I was driving around, we were monks and we were going across the country, a dead animal. Monks all, oh, money, pay, oh, money, pay, you know, they just say in Persia, it's dead animal. Well, they wouldn't have been praying a moment ago for it. And so there's cause and effect, right? There's, uh, in the technical terminology, they wouldn't be the cause, they'd be the condition, but it's linked. And so I, you know, I'm thinking about all this. And so I asked the abbot of my monastery, well, here's what I think. He listens to me. And he looks at me, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> and so if we start to understand that we are interdependent and that uh, the power, that energetic uh, interdependency, even you know, quantum physics, all these types of things that a lot of people are uh, creating the conditions around someone praying for someone. And even people knowing that someone's praying for them creates a different uh, potential for them to heal, for them to be well. Uh, there's a lot of studies that have been shown, uh, people that really have faith in their doctor, that have faith in the process, that know that people are praying for them, have much better outcomes for healing and well-being. And so it's not that we're praying particularly towards, like, you know, God to intervene. But if you think of what some people consider, you know, God, right, divine, as a divine intelligence, right? There's this web that we're all intricately, you know, the sun rises, there's rain, there's fall, something happens over in, in Europe, you know, there's something that triggers and it happens here. And the fact that we're seated here has something to do with me listening to my teacher, you know, all those years ago, which had something to do with me reading a book by Tenzin Palmo, all those years ago with someone who went to none. You start to see this web of interconnection uh, it is not a leap at all to think that um, me praying for you is going to wiggle that web. Not a leap at all. And so if we think instead of God is this thing as much as karma, karma I think fulfills any of the sort of uh, definitions, right? It's just this happens and that happens and these things happen and, and there's cause and effect and um, and that that we're affecting that web. So I think it makes a difference personally. Yeah, there's a lot of other factors there though too. Okay, is Aaron back there? No. Okay, is there anyone online who would like to ask a question? Since uh, we have Roxana back there. Not yet. Okay. Any other questions in here? And online, I know I need to give a minute because there's a delay factor. It is an easy crowd tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, well then we will uh, dedicate. And then uh, I believe pizza is going to be showing up momentarily. That's where Aaron disappeared to. I know we have uh, dishes in the hot pot and other things that are going to miraculously appear. <laughs> or was there a cause and effect result of conditions that gave rise? So. All right, well, let's just take a moment to be in this moment. And let us dedicate the merit and the wisdom that we have accumulated here today and throughout our lifetimes. Let us dedicate this for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all sentient beings be free of suffering. May they find their liberation and may we be able to use the merit and the wisdom accumulated here today and throughout our lifetimes to purify our own minds, to cultivate this path of a bodhisattva in ways that are truly meaningful for us, improving the quality of our current lives as well as our journey to truly be a benefit of all sentient beings. And may we also dedicate the merit and the wisdom accumulated here today and throughout our lifetimes 
for the long life of all spiritual teachers of all spiritual traditions that are authentically teaching the path to eliminate suffering. May their teachings flourish. May their students embrace these teachings.